Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Yonel Gog, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, Musketeer, all for one and one for all in data processing systems. Uh, but before I jump into the details about the system, I want to first introduce you to someone, to Kermit. Um, just a second. Uh, he he works for Sesame Incorporated, and he he wants to gain insights uh, from big data. Uh, he wants to uh, to improve his uh, business analytics business uh, business by running a batch computation, uh, analyze his company's social networks, and as well improve revenues by building a product recommendation engines. Um, he the question that he asks himself is uh, what system he should use uh, for. Uh, for for running these tasks, and the the way t in order to answer this, he had he first had a look at the current state of the art, and he found out that um, HDFS is the de facto distributed file system, but on top of it, there are uh, many general execution engines such as uh, Hadoop MapReduce, uh, Spark, Naiad. Moreover, there are several uh, specialized graph processing frameworks with few examples being uh, GraphG and PowerGraph. And finally, there are many languages and libraries uh, that have been developed to simplify big data de uh, development. Few examples are uh, GraphLink and Lindy uh, on top of Naiad, uh, Spark SQL and GraphX on top of, of, of Spark. But this is complete madness. I'm only showing a subset of the system that exists and there are already too many. Uh, and the question that Kermit asks himself is uh, which system is the right one to use. But luckily Kermit is a pedantic guy and uh, he decides to be scientifically uh, scientific about the process, so uh, he runs several experiments. Uh, before I tell you about the experiments that Kermit runs, let me first introduce you, introduce you to MakeSpan, which is a metric I will use throughout the entire presentation. MakeSpan means it's the entire time it takes from when Kermit submits a job until he gets the output. And it includes uh, pulling data from HDFS, uh, loading the data into the data processing system, the runtime of the job, and as well pushing the data back. So now going back to, the, to Kermit's experiment, in the first experiment, he executed his joining two data sets. On the y-axis, we have make span, and less is better. The two data sets, the, the two data sets are asymmetric, and they are only generating about 1.3 gigabytes of output. And it turns out that on this data, with these data sets, uh, a simple uh, single-threaded uh, C implementation has the lowest make span. But Kermit wanted to see if this actually holds uh, on a different data set. So he used uh, two symmetric data sets that generate about 29 gigabytes of output. Uh, he executed the query, and he found out that uh, the single tree, uh, single, uh, single threaded C implementation actually performs the worst, and in this case, Hive and Hadoop are, are the best ones. And this is due to the fact that Hive and Hadoop manage uh, to exploit parallel I.O. Uh, Puzzled at, at the outcome, um, Kermit wanted to see if, if at least among uh, graph processing systems there is, there is a clear winner. So he executed a page run computation on the Twitter graph, which has uh, 42 million vertices and 1.4 billion edges. Uh, as some people still do, he first executed a computation using uh, Hadoop on 100 nodes, uh, and obviously it doesn't work that well. So, uh, however, Kermit also heard of Spark, and he executed a computation using, using Spark. Um, and finally, Kermit decided to, to try uh, the new kid on the block, uh, which is a graph link on top of Naiad. He did so, and it turns out that GraphLink outperforms uh, the, the other systems. Um, but Kermit is uh, rather inquisitive, and he wanted to see how well these systems work at a smaller scale. So he executed the previously best performer on 16 nodes, and it turns out that uh, GraphLink is faster than Hadoop. Uh, than Hadoop use, uh, uh, than GraphLink is faster than Hadoop that's running on 100 nodes. Kermit also wanted to try a graph-specific system, so he ran the computation in Power Graph, and he discovered that uh, in, uh, at this scale, Power Graph outperforms GraphLink. Um, lastly, Kermit has also heard of uh, Frank McSherry and his uh, laptop and his future paper from HotOS. So he, he ran the computation on a single machine 
uh, using GraphG. Uh, it's not as fast as Frank Mesheri's laptop, but it still works quite well. Um, so after running this experiment, Kermit concluded that uh, GraphLink is the fastest if you control resources to it, uh, and uh, GraphG is actually the most resource efficient. It only uses one machine, and it's not 100 times slower than GraphLink using, a, using 100 machines. However, there's also, he also noticed that for, the, that for the two simple queries he executed, five different systems are, can be best. And he, Kermit is it's confused. And how can we actually help Kermit to pick the right system for his, uh, for, for, for his tasks? So if you go back to the, to the previous slide, and we step back and we look at it, we observe that there are two types of systems. On one hand, we have um, languages and libraries which are used to express the computation. A few examples are GraphLink and Lindy and SparkSQL. I will call them from now on front-end languages. And then there's also a second type of systems which are used to run the computations, and they are the, da uh, the data processing uh, systems, such as uh, MapReduce and, or, or Spark. From now on, I will call them back-end execution engines. Now, with this taxonomy in mind, if we rearrange the figure and we put the front-end languages on the left-hand side and the back-end execution engines on the right-hand side, then, then things are starting to look better. However, there's still a problem. If Kermit, for example, picks, writes his computation in his favorite front-end language, which is Hive, um, then his computation Will, uh, will, will always run in, in, uh, in Hadoop MapReduce. And this creates a fixed, uh, fixed binding. Kermit is locked in into a backend execution engine. And, and this stops him from benefiting from other backend, backend execution engines. So wouldn't it be nice to actually be able to translate from front-end uh, languages into an intermediate representation, and then from the inter intermediate representation to backend execution engines? This is exactly what Musketeer does. Musketeer supports four front-end languages, with Hive and Lindy among them, uh, and six uh, popular back-end executions, with Spark, um, Hadoop, and Iand among them. Um, so now having seen what Musketeer does, let me tell you a little bit uh, uh, more about how it works. Uh, Musketeer um, has a pipeline of, of six steps, and in the first step, it takes the workflow from, from Kermit. The workflow can be, it can be defined in one of our front-end languages. It can be a SQL query or gather, apply, uh, scatter kernel. Uh, then the workflow is translated into an intermediate representation based on relational al algebra, and it, which, contains, which has operators such as join and select. I will tell you more about it in a second. Um, then on this intermediate representation, uh, Musketeer, um, Musketeer uh, applies uh, rewrite rules, such as uh, bringing uh, selective operators up and uh, pushing down generative ones. Uh, these rewrite rules are standard rewrite rules that can be found in other uh, front-end languages, such as um, Hive or Sparse SQL. Um, however, there is one thing that distinguishes Musketeer uh, uh, from the front-end languages. The moment a developer implements an optimization on the intermediate representation, all the front-end languages will benefit from it. After, after we apply optimizations, Musketeer tries to recognize special types of computation. There are, there, are, there are special types of computation that follow a particular data flow structure. One such uh, example of uh, one such type of computations are uh, graph processing uh, workflows. And we want to be able to recognize them uh, in order to decide if we actually want to run them in in backend execution engines that have been purposely built, uh, built to handle them. Uh, in the next step of the Musketeer pipeline, uh, Musketeer tries to decide how to run the data flow operators. The naive way would be to run every operator as a, as, as a single job. However, this is not ideal because of high uh, job startup costs and as well redundant input data scans. So instead, Musketeer tries to, to merge operators within the constraints of the backend execution engines. And essentially, operator merging is trying to minimize the number of jobs required to run the, the operators. After we decide on um, the jobs we need to, to uh, on how many jobs we need, we also need to decide on which backend execution engines to use. 
Um, so for example, it may make sense to run the previously uh, detected uh, gr uh, graph computation in a graph processing system. Finally, in the last step of the Musketeer pipeline, Musketeer generates, uh, generates code for the chosen backend engines and dispatches the jobs. Um, these are the six main steps. Uh, unfortunately, I only have time to talk about three of them. Uh, for more details, please check the paper. As I, as I promised, um, the Musketeer intermediate representation consists of a DAG of data flow operators. Uh, the operators are really based on rational algebra, but we also extended the intermediate representation with support for, uh, with, with fixed point iterations, and as well user-defined functions. Uh, this makes the intermediate representation pretty general and as well Turing complete. Uh, but let me now jump towards the end of the pipeline and tell, uh, so that I can tell you a little bit more about one of the most difficult problems we had to solve. And that's uh, mapping to systems. And it's difficult because there are exponentially many combinations of mappings to, si and to, mappings to systems. Um, so if we start uh, on the left-hand side of the slide, I have a page run computation. And there are actually several ways that one could run this computation. You could run it as a combination of Hadoop jobs, or in some world, it may make sense to run it as a combination of Hadoop and, and, and GraphG. And deciding on how to run this computation and setting these job boundaries is equivalent, equivalent to partitioning the DAG. And after we partition the DAG, we also have to decide on the system bindings. Essentially, for every partition, we have to decide what backend execution system to use. Now, these, problems are, these two problems are interdependent, and uh, actually the combination of these two problems is uh, equivalent to the K-way graph partitioning problem, which is NP-hard. Um, so I, I can tell you a little bit more about some tricks that we do to make this work in practice. Uh, first, let me, let me tell you how we decide on which backend uh, executions, uh, execution systems to use. For that, we use a simple cost model that has three main signals. One is data volume. Uh, for every operator, uh, depending on its, uh, on its type, we try to, and, and as well on uh, the, the input size, we try to predict uh, the, the size of its output. The second signal is operator performance. So we, we run uh, benchmarks for every operator in every uh, backend execution engine we support. And finally, in data centers, uh, workflows, they tend to, to run periodically. They run every few hours, every few days. So for every run, we record information about the, the input size, the intermediate data size, and as well uh, the output size. And we fed in uh, the, uh, this information into the cost model. Now, in order to answer the job boundaries question, we use um, two uh, search strategies. One uh, is the exhaustively searches the uh, the, the, the space for all the possible job boundaries. However, this strategy only works well on, on workflows of uh, up to around 14 operators because its complexity is exp exponential. Uh, for larger workflows, uh, we use a dynamic heuristic that works in the following way. Um, I'm gonna use the same paint rank example. So the dynamic heuristic takes the workflow as an input, then it topologically um, topologically sorts it in order to get a linear ordering, and then on that linear ordering, it applies a dynamic programming algorithm that has a nice property of giving the optimal solution with regards to the linear ordering and the cost model. Uh, this turns out to work quite well in practice. Um, lastly, uh, the, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about how Musketeer generates code. Um, for every a uh, combination of operator and backend execution engine, Musketeer has uh, template implementations. And whenever we need to generate code uh, for, uh, whenever we need to generate code for a job that consists of several operators, we recursively expand the templates. And we also make sure that we don't add any overhead. You can check the paper uh, for more details. After we generate the code, we, 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 dispatch, uh, we dispatch the jobs to the backend execution engines. Now, having seen how, what are the steps of the Musketeer uh, pipeline, let me tell, uh, let's see if it actually can, can help Kermit. And I'm gonna try to answer three questions. Um, can Kermit use Musketeer to actually reduce his uh, workflow's max span? Max span? Um, what is the overhead of Musketeer auto-generated code versus Kermit uh, working long hours to hand implement uh, the workflows? 
Uh, and finally, well, when Kermit uh, lets Musketeer decide which systems to use, how often Musketeer gets it right. We first ask Kermit to execute one of his uh, business analytics queries, and he first executed uh, TPCH query number 17. Uh, on, uh, on the y-axis, we have MakeSpan, and on the, x, on the x axis, we have TPC, TPCH scale factor, and 100 corresponds to about 77 uh, gigabytes. Um, in, in, in addition to his favorite front end, uh, Hive, Kermit also wants to try, uh, decided to try this new system, uh, uh, Nyad, and he implemented the workflow on, on, on Lindy, uh, and he executed the Lindy on Nyad. It turns out that. Um, to, see, to his surprise, it didn't, it didn't work that well. And this is to the fact that Lindy's uh, group by operator actually uh, gathers all the data on a single machine where it groups it by. Uh, finally, we suggested uh, to Kermit that he should try to use Musketeer. Uh, he did so. And Musketeer uh, performs quite well in this case. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, actually, Musketeer uh, generates a combination of low-level NIAD uh, and Lindy, and by doing so, it manages to fix the limitation of, uh, of Lindy's group by. This is all done automatically without any effort required from Kermit. In the next experiment, uh, we asked Kermit to test his uh, uh, recommendation engine uh, using the Netflix data set. Uh, this experiment is different from the previous one because uh, the intermediate data size can be quite large. In our case, it, it ends up being somewhere around 900 gigabytes. Um, since this is a fair amount of, of data, Kermit decided to first use uh, Hadoop. Uh, and it turns out that Hadoop doesn't work that well. Uh, but luckily, he's, he also heard of, of Spark, and he executed the same uh, workflow on Spark. And Spark indeed works better because it stores the data, the intermediate data, into memory. However, Kermit decided to give an, another, another go and to try Nyad again. And he did so. Uh, he implemented a for workflow in Lindy, and in this case, um, uh, the make, uh, NIAD's make span is 30, uh, 35% percent, uh, faster than Spark. Finally, he runs um, Musketeer, and uh, Musketeer generated code performs as well as, as NIAD. Actually, in fact, in this, co in this case, uh, Musketeer generates NIAD code. Um, we asked Kermit to test how well Musketeer works on his uh, uh, graph processing um, computation. He executed at 100 node scale, and Musketeer works almost as well as uh, GraphLink. Then at 60 node scale, Musketeer generates code, which is almost as good as PowerGraph. And finally, at one node scale, Musketeer generates uh, GraphG code, which is almost as good as uh, the, uh, the baseline. Uh, but Kermit is, uh, is, is, uh, wanted to be scientific about it, and he decided to check exactly what are the overheads of Musketeer generated code. So he ran the same computation in every backend execution engine, and uh, he, he compared uh, the runtime of the, his baselines with the runtime of the Musketeer generated code. And it turns out that in, uh, uh, the overhead is between 5 and 20% for Spark, Nyad, PowerGraph, and GraphG. We also have one outlier, which is Hadoop, where the overhead is about 30%, but that can be uh, sorted out with more <coughs> engineering effort. Um, Finally, uh, in our last experiment, we tried to evaluate how well Musketeer uh, can pick backend execution engines. So we used six workflows. Some of them you already seen. Some of them are new. And we also varied the, the input data size. And we ended up with 33 different configurations. Uh, we first asked Kermit to build a simple decision tree based on his knowledge of uh, big data processing and on the experiments he executed. And this uh, decision tree makes the uh, same decision such as if the computation is graph, uh, is graph, graph computation run it on a specialized system? If the data is small, use a single machine, or if the data large, use uh, something that scales well. Uh, in, the, in this graph, um, I show you uh, the fractions of workflows, in which case, um, with green, uh, the simple decision tree decide, uh, pick the best option, uh, and with yellow, the decision was within 10% of the best option. With orange and, 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 and red, it's bad. Uh, it's just bad. Um, we, it turns out that the decision tree works well in about 55% of the cases. Now, we, we executed Musketeer, and in this experiment, Musketeer doesn't have any information about the workflow. And in this case, the, the Musketeer works almost as well as a Kermit's uh, decision tree. 
In, and in the next experiment, we actually added some information about the workflow. So you have the data sizes of some intermediate operators. And the, in, in, in the, it ended up that uh, the Musketeer automatic mapper uh, works well in about 85% uh, of the cases. And finally, when Musketeer has full information about all the intermediate data sizes and the output, um, Musketeer uh, picks the, the, the right system in about 85% of the cases, and it's always within 10% of the best choice. To sum up, Musketeer automatically translates workflows and maps to many data processing systems it's easy to use and makes workflows uh, portable and faster. Uh, with Musketeer, uh, Kermit no longer has to be a hermit. Uh, he doesn't have to work long hours because he can automatically generate his jobs. Um, and um, one more thing, uh, now Musketeer can generate power Lyra. Um, Jobs. Um, he, uh, Kermit was very keen on on, generate, on on the results from the PowerLira talk, so we added support for PowerLira. Uh, for more details, check the website. Uh, soon we'll do uh, an open source release. Thank you. Uh, Jim Laris, UPFL. Nice talk. Thank you. So uh, a few years ago, Mike Stonebreaker um, was publicizing the idea that uh, NoSQL databases weren't really that different than what had come before and that they would eventually evolve to being uh, SQL databases. So it looks to me like you're basically doing optimization for uh, a distributed database system, like what has been done for many, many years in the SQL world. Are, are there differences? Um, so uh, I guess I mean uh, the the area in which the main goal of the project is to actually pick the, the the right system and the optimization. From what I know, they work. They are similar to the, what we were doing with the optimization rules over the intermediate representation. Um, and th there are some differences because in this case, uh, for example, the backend execution engines they have some limitations. Uh, one such example is, like, is Hadoop. In Hadoop, uh, you can only run certain operators together as a single job. Um, so you can, for example, you can't run a join and another join as a single job, but you can run other operators uh, together, a join and a select. And I assume that in the databases, you don't have this, in the database world, you don't have these limitations when you are doing these optimizations. So, okay, uh, thank you. Hi, this is Gustavo Alonso from ETH in Zurich. Uh, so continuing a little bit in the database theme, right? Uh, I think it's excellent work and comparing all these systems provides a lot of very useful information, right, that people need to keep in mind. But I'm always a little bit surprised and I refer like the previous question to the previous talk, right? I just refer to your work where it applies to all these things, right? Uh, why are you looking at a single job, right? I mean, yes, a single job, maybe I can run it on. Why are you looking at a single job? Uh, because, yes, one job, I can run it on one machine, but if you have 100 machines, it's probably because you are interested in throughput, right? Uh, you want to be able to run hundreds or maybe thousands of these things concurrently and so forth, right? So, if one looks at throughput, what happens to what you're proposing, right? I mean, how many of your optimizations and ideas work when you have only one job in the system, and what happens when I try to run 100 of these things at the same time? You know, like a database, right? Yeah. So I, I, I actually agree with that question. Uh, the problem is that at, in, in the community there's no well-defined kind of uh, benchmark for that. We need a set of workflows that should be executed. You know, we need uh, how, uh, how, how, how we, and we don't have that, right? And we don't, uh, we don't know how, how well that, uh, how, you know, what, what jobs we should run, how often they should run, and we don't have that information. But I think that would be the, the fair thing to do. Uh, Oh, okay, I, I right. Let, let me just give you a hard time for the sake of the spirit of heuristics, right? Yeah. Uh, you don't need to have a benchmark. Just take the job that you have and run it 100 times at the same time, right? And, and see whether the results that you have still apply, right? I mean, yes, I understand there is no standard benchmark for this, right? But you can just take the, just the job that you have and run it in parallel, right? And see what happens, right? I mean, whether the results that you have still apply or not, right? Um. I, I, I think that's basically what we should do in, in, in future work. I completely agree. Fair enough. Thanks.